And this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up in the next hour, Amazon joins the Trillion Dollar Valuation Club. How the e-commerce giant will fare alongside Apple. The air is thin up there. Plus, tech testify. Sheryl Sandberg and Jack Dorsey get ready to face the bright lights of Capitol Hill. Can they keep lawmakers at bay? And should Musk be worrying about an SEC ban? Some legal analysts say not so much. We'll discuss the likelihood of the Tesla CEO being suspended. But first, to our top story, Amazon is starting September with a bang. Shares of the tech giant pushing the company beyond a market value of $1 trillion, a milestone that Apple reached just last month. Big accomplishment, not just for the company, but for CEO Jeff Bezos, who is currently the world's wealthiest person. Most notable was the speed with which Amazon hit that milestone. Shares have more than tripled in the last three years. Tech competitors Alphabet and Microsoft are closing in on the mark as well. Joining us to discuss, we have Tigris Financial Partners Chief Investment Officer Ivan Feinsath and also with us Bloomberg Tech Global Editor Brad Stone. Brad, you know, I'm so glad you're here because you started covering Amazon in 1999 and it was just two or three steps beyond being just an online bookstore back then. How did we get here? Well, it's funny because when I first visited Jeff Bezos up in Seattle, Amazon stock price had fallen into the single digits. Uh, employees were panicking, and he wrote on, his, on the whiteboard in his office, we are not our stock price. And it's something that Amazon employees might remember today because as the, as the uh, chart that you showed demonstrates, I mean, this company has been propelled, yes, by strong fundamentals and increasing net income, but really by a wave of optimism, right? That everything that Amazon is involved in will Will turn out well. This market capitalization has tripled in just the past few years, and everything's got to go perfectly for Amazon to justify this valuation and, and to keep growing. So Amazon, it's not it's not a stock price. It is doing quite well, uh, you know, in all of its core businesses. It's transformed its operation into a marketplace and a service that that helps other customers, other retailers sell online. Uh, but clearly, there's a lot of optimism. Out there. Well, and Ivan, let's let's talk about the reality here. How likely is it that everything? will go perfectly as Brad says well I don't think they really expect it to go perfectly it's a company that takes risks they get into new businesses they invest in growth and they are continuing to expand outside their core business by adding different services on into their online retail uh, supply chain management system and also their web host uh, Amazon Web Services. They're adding big data analytics, they're adding AI capabilities, so they keep expanding what they do. And I think the next big area that Amazon goes into is going to be focusing on healthcare. So, look, Brad, I'm looking at the chart from 1999 and looking at the speed of which shares have risen over the last three years. Is this rational? Well, uh, you know, the, the kind of market decides that. Um, I mean, clearly, yes, it is. These are all rational actors who are buying and holding Amazon stock. This is a company that has executed extraordinarily well over the past, you know, 10 years. The acceleration and loyalty towards Amazon via Amazon Prime, you know, the, the increasing success of fulfillment by Amazon, where Amazon turns its warehouses uh, over to, to third parties, all the things it does so well, I mean, you know, and, Online retail is still 5% of total retail in the U.S. It's much smaller in other markets. So I think some of the opti optimism is investors rationally looking and seeing that Amazon is an extraordinarily well-run company in markets that have so much room for growth. So PetroChina briefly crossed the trillion dollar mark in late 2007. Oil prices then crashed. Ivan, do you see some big, you know, potential challenge or, or, or headwinds out there that could uh, lead to some downside risk here? Well, there could be with the recent run up and the long term run up, there could be some profit taking. And there are a lot of value. In, there is a lot of value in a number of other leading tech stocks, uh, specifically Google. I think that Google is a tremendous value here. It has not increased and doesn't trade at the valuation that Amazon does, yet it has a lot of the key business drivers similar to Amazon. So also Microsoft is, again, close to the trillion dollar mark, too. It's a little bit ahead of Google. Microsoft is evolving into a leading cloud play as well. So I think you could have some profit taking, 
in Amazon and people reallocating the money into other stocks that also have potential to go across the trillion dollar or at least increase in value as well. Brad, what about the threat of regulation? Is that the biggest threat here? Right. You know, we talk about this trillion dollar mark when really it's a subjective number. Amazon's not different than it was yesterday, than it is going to be perhaps tomorrow. Uh, but it is important in, in one, you know, in one context, which is that it puts an incredibly visible target on the backs of these companies, right? There's no better illustration that they dominate our landscape. And I think, look, you know, Amazon's seeing it uh, from the right with Trump and his tweets about uh, taxes and the post office, uh, and of course, Jeff's uh, ownership of the Washington Post, and on the left from Bernie Sanders and about wage uh, growth uh, and, and uh, public assistance in Amazon's fulfillment centers. I think there's a big conversation about whether Amazon's commitment to low prices is having an impact on some macroeconomic indicators like inflation. And look, I think that, you know, a Amazon's the biggest target around. So I do think that regulation is one of their biggest challenges and potentially obstacles in the years ahead. That said, Ivan, uh, the venture capitalist Shamath Palihapitiya thinks Amazon will be the first company to hit the $3 trillion mark. I know it's hard to look that far ahead, but what do you think of that prediction? Well, I think the stock still has further potential for a number of reasons. It is, along with Apple, the dominant stocks in the S&P 500. So as money continues to go into the market, passive investors have to, they're both close to 4% each of the S&P 500. So four cents out of every dollar going into an index, S&P index fund goes into Amazon, into Apple. And with the rise in the market, it's going to attract more money. So I think it continues to trade up on that. Basis. Second is they are a very fast growing company and they continue to evolve into new businesses and develop new markets and go after markets that are fast growing that they can bring their uh, if operating efficiencies to. And I think that they are going to continue to do that, which will drive more growth. So I think there is further upside in the stock. So uh, two trillion, I mean, three trillion is a, probably a ways away. But at some point, when the market rises significantly, Amazon is going to continue to rise significantly as well. 3T, Brad? <laughs> You know, it, it seems excessive, but one trillion in 2018 would have surprised me also. And look, Amazon makes a lot of bets, plants a lot of seeds. You know, Alexa is one of them. It's a new computing platform, and it's kind of leading this voice market. If they bring that into cars and into the enterprise, into the workplace, then yeah, I, I see a lot of different opportunities for Amazon. Too bad you are a journalist and couldn't buy shares on that day in 1999. All right, Bloomberg Tech's Brad Stone, thank you so much, as well as Tigris Financial Partners Chief Investment Officer Ivan Fine says, Ivan, always great to have you reviews here on the show. Coming up, Sheryl Sandberg and Jack Dorsey get ready for their congressional grilling. What kind of reception can they expect from lawmakers? We will discuss next. And if you like Bloomberg News, check us out on the radio. Listen on the Bloomberg app, Bloomberg.com, and in the U.S. on Sirius XM. This is Bloomberg. Representatives from the two biggest U.S. social media platforms are set to testify before Congress on Wednesday. This time, Facebook COO Sheryl Sandberg and Twitter CEO Jack Dorsey are expected to face questions on their progress in fighting Russian election meddling and more. The two will appear together in front of the Senate Intelligence Committee in the morning before Dorsey has his solo date in the afternoon with the House Energy and Commerce Committee. They will be feeling the heat when it comes to data privacy and accusations that social media companies are silencing conservative voices. Joining us now from Washington, Washington, Dr. Todd Helmuth, senior behavioral scientist with the RAND Corporation. In August, he testified before the Senate Intelligence Committee on Russia's social media influence. And in New York, we have Bloomberg Opinion columnist Shira Ovide. Uh, now, a day ahead of this testimony, what do these two companies have at stake? Look, I think the, the stakes for them are they don't want to misstep. They don't want to say anything they shouldn't. And I think both Jack Dorsey and Sheryl Sandberg are pretty practiced spokespeople for their companies at this point, and I don't anticipate that they will uh, set a foot wrong. The, the, the challenge, though, is that you never know what members of Congress will ask, right? That the hearings are about election interference in the Senate's case and about kind of free speech and censorship on the House case, but the members of Congress can ask whatever they want, and that's the real risk, is that they'll be asked something that they can't answer and say the wrong thing. 
So, uh, Dr. Helmus, knowing what you know about uh, Russia's influence, you know, what kinds of questions do you think they should uh, have to answer to, given what you know about the scope of this interference and, and the likelihood that it's happening again? Well, Emily, last year, uh, when the lawyers for the tech companies testified, the key question was, um, what, uh, what, how did Russia use those platforms in the uh, 2016 election? And this year, the question is going to be a bit different. I think now the fundamental issue is, what have these platforms done uh, to protect the United States against future, future uh, Russian information attacks? So what do you think about what they have done? I mean, they're adding artificial intelligence. They're adding thousands of jobs. And yet, you know, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, we heard that the, the, the companies both shut down hundreds of accounts, not just tied to Russia, but Iran. Uh, yeah, no, it's, a, it's a, this, a steep issue that they have to climb. And I think particularly interesting about um, recently is they detected a number of uh, pages that appeared to be Russian in origin. And some of those uh, have been up for 15 months uh, before they got detected. So um, obviously a fundamental issue is can these uh, companies detect Russian actions um, or other foreign government actions on their sites? Um, and then once they do detect it, what are they going to do to shut it down? Um, that's really a fundamental question. Uh, obviously, the, the recent uh, intrusions show that detecting that stuff is not an easy task, um, and it's an uphill battle. Now, uh, Shira, we spoke with Representative Ryan Costello last week. He is on the House Energy and Commerce Committee. We'll be questioning Jack Dorsey. Take a listen to uh, the questions he would like Mr. Dorsey to answer. But can you demonstrate, can you sort of open your, your algorithm up to us so that we're able to see that it, there's not content bias there? And then I think the other thing that is less about uh, whether there's a uh, uh, philosophical bias there as something even more fundamental, and that is, does your algorithm, in essence, reward extremist rhetoric, be it on the left or on the right? We are at a moment in time where the very fabric of our political culture continues to deteriorate. Now, uh, Mark Zuckerberg has already been through this. We can expect, perhaps, that Sheryl Sandberg will uh, stick very closely to what Zuckerberg has already said um, uh, before Congress. What makes Dorsey's appearance, Shira, different? I mean, obviously, the platform is, is completely different in size and scope, and, and Twitter has actually talked about how they just don't have the resources that Facebook has to stop this stuff. Yeah, I mean, resources are certainly an issue uh, at Twitter that, as you said, Facebook does not have a resources problem. You know, it's interesting, The you know, the representative talked about opening up algorithms f to kind of outside review, which is an issue that has now come up both on the left side of the political spe spectrum and on the right side of the political spectrum. And I don't think that's something that any of the uh, internet companies would permit to happen. But it's an interesting idea, right, that there's a growing recognition that what we see on Facebook and what we see on Google is not the result of some, you know, neutral computers uh, reacting to the ideas of, of billions of people, but it, they're, they're the result of algorithms created by human beings, right? And human beings with all their inherent bias. And I think those are interesting questions about, you know, what actually goes into the search results we see on Google or uh, how our Facebook news feed is ordered and does it reward uh, kind of the most egregious and strongly held opinions no matter how wrong they are and what if anything should be done to stop it. I think those are, you know, big questions about the internet, what kind of internet we want to have in the future. Dr. Helmus, to that point, human beings are inherently flawed inherently biased. They build the technology um, and the artificial intelligence that is fighting um, this kind of meddling. So, so given what you know about how the Russians achieved what they achieved in 2016, is it really possible for Facebook and Twitter, which are run by human beings, to stay ahead of the meddling when we know that the attackers are, are always sort of uh, one step more advanced than we are, if not more? Yeah, that's a fundamental problem. I mean, it really is an arms race out there uh, because um, you're right, as Facebook and Twitter and others and researchers look to detect ways of identifying their content, um, uh, the Russians and certainly other governments such as Chinese, uh, China and, uh, and other, other actor, actors 
um, we'll be detecting new ways to, uh, uh, to insert that content in there. And some of the ways that have been used to detect the content so far, I mean, what Russia paid for, uh, some of its uh, social media campaigns in rubles back in 2016, and they probably won't make that mistake again. So it is going to be an arms race. Um, I think the trick is is to continue the research. It's, um, we'll make it a very easy arms race if there are not funds put forward to uh, conduct the relevant research on this and if the platforms do not keep trying to uh, fight, the, fight the good fight. Shira, uh, you know, walk us through how Google fits into this, given that they are not uh, sending their CEO. Congress was not very happy about that, uh, but Google will still be present. Yeah, I think it's going to be incredibly awkward, right, if there's basically an empty chair where a Google representative is supposed to go. And in a way, that makes them an easy punching bag at this hearing in the Senate tomorrow that we just... Uh, you know, they're obviously part of the internet conversation, uh, both in terms of search and on YouTube. And to not have a representative there, it just feels like a misstep by Google. Although I can understand that they didn't want to send Larry Page, who I think would be um, uh, awkward in that, in that setting, to say the least. All right. Shira Ovide, Bloomberg Opinion, and Dr. Todd Helmus of the RAND Corporation. Of course, we're going to be covering these hearings throughout the week. Meantime, Facebook's revenue slowdown and heightened regulatory scrutiny amounts to a toxic brew. That's according to Moffat Nathanson founding partner Michael Nathanson, who downgraded his rating to neutral from buy. Nathanson writes, a shift in model from user-generated content to more third-party content coupled with higher security spend to reassure regulators will weigh on margins. Still ahead, China is said to be considering its position in the race for 5G dominance. Will the nation get the jump? on the United States. We'll discuss that next. And Bloomberg Tech is live streaming on Twitter. You can check us out at Technology. Be sure to follow our global breaking news network, TikTok, on Twitter. This is Bloomberg. The global fight to dominate 5G is on. Now, China is said to be exploring a mega merger between two of the nation's three Wireless carriers, a merger between the nation's second and third biggest telcos, China, Unicom and Telecom, would create the world's second largest wireless operator after China Mobile and give the nation greater scale to speed up development of 5G and gain advantage over the United States. Let's bring in Asia Society senior fellow Isaac Stone Fish. So, Isaac, first of all, walk us through the benefits and to whom of a merger of this size. So if, if China Unicom and China Telecom, I guess Una Telecom or whatever they decide to call it, if they do merge, you're going to see a much larger customer base, which allows for a lot more data analytics, a lot more trials, a lot more ability to hit a really large market. It would immediately put them up at second, right below China Mobile. I think also they would get a lot more government support, which is always key in China. This is a example that Beijing is trying to make this company into much more of a, a global player and would presumably put a lot more resources behind it. So what are the drawbacks, especially for, I suppose, China Mobile? So the drawbacks, certainly for China Mobile, is that it has another big domestic competitor. It's also a sign that perhaps Beijing and the party is looking a little bit less favorably as to what the company has and is doing. I, I think another drawback, though, for the, the two second and third largest Chinese telecoms in China is that putting companies together like this is not necessarily going to lead to more innovation, more efficiency. This is not a market-driven move. This is a party-driven move. So we don't actually know if the numbers make sense, if the fundamentals make sense to put these companies together, or this is just something that Beijing is doing for inscrutable reasons. Now, we're seeing a similar situation here in the United States with with T-Mobile with working towards a, a merger with Sprint. Um, on the day that that was announced, John Ledger, the CEO of T-Mobile, said, if we don't take decisive positive action, we risk ceding global leadership in both 5G and the entire next wave of technology to a country other than America. Would a, a China Unicom and Telecom merger mean that the U.S. loses its footing when it comes to 5G? I do like how he says a country other than America, like he's <laughs> afraid to even say China. I, I do think this is 
would be bad news for major American telecoms companies. I mean, I think it's too early to say that this means that they're losing their footing when it comes to 5G, but it's certainly, as far as American competitors are facing it, it's certainly a step in the wrong direction. Meantime, uh, to another story um, out of China, um, netizens are obsessed with the arrest of the founder of JD.com, who is now facing charges in the United States of sexual misconduct. Now, it is very um, un unclear what these charges actually involve. Uh, sexual misconduct, um, where he was arrested in the state of Minnesota, can mean a lot of different things. Uh, but he's a huge figure in China, a very popular figure, and, and these billionaires and tech titans in China, um, their lives often become tabloid fodder. Um, what do you make of this, this particular situation, what it means for him, what it means for the company? I think it's important, like you did, to emphasize that right now we know very little about what the accusations are and whether or not, you know, any indication to whether or not he is guilty of what he might be accused of doing. However, it's hard to see this as anything but bad for Richard Liu and bad for JD.com. Even if it turns out that the charges were completely groundless, it's a lot of bad press. It's embarrassing for China, not you know, not necessarily in the way that we see it, but it's very easy to imagine that people in Beijing will say, oh gosh, this is making China lose face by having this these embarrassing allegations. And there's almost no sense that this has anything at all to do with U.S.-China trade or any bigger political dynamics. It really just feels like this is something that Liu is accused of doing. Right. Uh, there are also reports that, um, you know, something happened at, at one of his residences in Australia for which he wasn't charged, but another guest actually was um, and was convicted, uh, you know, what does this mean for rivals? I mean, could, could this give Alibaba a leg up? I think this is certainly good for rivals. I think Jack Ma has more of a reputation as not a Boy Scout, because they don't have Boy Scouts in China in the same way, but as someone who handles issues in a, in a bit more of a, of a moralistic fashion, whereas Richard Liu is a little bit brasher, younger, a little bit more charismatic in a way. And I, I think this certainly gives Jack Ma ammunition to subtly go after Richard Leo's character. And it's also you know, a good time for them to possibly move into some of JD.com's businesses while Richard Leo and JD are distracted. I will say that as soon as he got back to Beijing, Liu attended a event, he attended a signing, he's trying to say, hey, this is business as usual, but if the state of Minnesota, if the Minnesota police come back with a serious allegation, it'll certainly be a big distraction. Um, I should mention there are no charges, just uh, accusations at this point. Um, but of course, the story will continue to follow and bring you any more details as we have them. Asia Society senior fellow Isaac Stonefish for us in New York. Coming up, Mark Zuckerberg was the first big name tech exec to testify. Now Sheryl Sandberg and Jack Dorsey are in the hot seat. We'll discuss. This is Bloomberg. Technology. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. Back now to our top story. Amazon finally joined the $1 trillion valuation club, a milestone that tech giant Apple hit just last month. And while this is great news for the company, no one is benefiting more than founder Jeff Bezos. Bezos has added $67 billion to his fortune just this year. This gives him a $167 billion net worth on the Bloomberg Billionaires Index as of early Tuesday. For more, we are joined by Bloomberg's Tom Metcalf, uh, who, who has been following Bezos's wealth accumulation. So, um, Tom, talk to us about just how quickly Bezos's wealth has has uh, ballooned as the stock has run up in just the last three years. Uh, it's been absolutely incredible. I've been watching it for those whole three years, and you know he has now got a 160 billion dollar fortune, which was big enough at the start of the year at 100 billion. And you go back a few years, it was sort of in the the, the low tens. So you, and that's basically been exactly tracking uh, Amazon's share price, which is up, I think, 74% alone this year. For a company of that size, it's uh, pretty unprecedented. And it's not just Bezos, but his family, uh, who, who has also made out, I believe, you know, both of his parents invested in the company, his siblings invested in the company. To what end? 
Yeah, it's you know investing in Amazon as, as early as, as they were able to. This is sort of at a share price of 0.2, uh, sorry, 20 cents a share or something, and you're now looking at uh, over $2,000 a share. It's one of the all-time great investments. So, as a family, uh, they need no more assistance. I think they're just trying to work out how they can uh, give away their money fast enough to keep pace with this um, uh, this great growth. How does the speed with which they've accumulated this wealth compare to, you know, other very wealthy founders like Mark Zuckerberg, um, like the founders of Google, like Bill Gates? In terms of the absolute numbers, there's like no comparison. So Jeff Bezos is actually the richest person in modern history. So you go back to what Bill Gates was doing with Microsoft in sort of the early 2000s. He did hit $100 billion. That would be worth in sort of real terms today about $140, $150 billion. Bezos is blown by that. And in terms of just sheer billions being accumulated, there's really nothing in, in history to compare. So, Tom, you know, what are the risks here? You know, he's, he's got a lot of money, he's investing in a lot of things, he's got his philanthropic efforts, he's got his space company, Blue Origin. You know, what are the risks um, once your fortune gets so large? Well, well, the biggest risk for Bezos is he's just not diversified at all. Something like you know, more than 95% of his fortune is in one stock. So in the case of Amazon, this has worked out perfectly. But when I speak to wealth advisors, you know, they would have their head in their hands for an ordinary uh, kind of wealthy person. They would be begging them to, hey, sell more stock, uh, which Bezos really doesn't do apart from to fund Blue Origin, which is probably one of the few riskier things you can find out there. That is a space exploration company. So that's part of the reason he's had such mammoth returns. You know, just purely from a you know risk reward perspective, it's it's very very risky. All right, Tom Metcalf, Bloomberg News. Thank you so much, and for all the work you do on the Bloomberg Billionaires Index. Now we are continuing our look at this week's tech testimonies on Capitol Hill. First, Facebook, Google, and Twitter sent their lawyers to explain what they're doing in the fight against Russian election meddling. Then it was Mark Zuckerberg's turn. Baton in April as he defended Facebook on the grounds that it was careless with its users' data. Now, Jack Dorsey and Sheryl Sandberg will appear before Congress for the first time. The focus is back to where all of this started in October, Russian election interference. I want to bring in the man who literally wrote the book on Facebook, Techonomy founder and editor-in-chief, David Kirkpatrick. Um, David, you know uh, better than anybody else how Mark Zuckerberg and Sheryl Sandberg have very different commuter communication styles. Um, Sheryl Sandberg is, is, is much more used to being under the bright lights, yet um, she's also fairly scripted. How do you expect her to perform uh, tomorrow in the hot seat? Well, I'm not hoping for too much candor. Uh, I, I mean, I would hope for it, but I'm not expecting it. Um, <clears throat> I actually would suspect that in comparison, we will think that Zuckerberg did an extremely good job. I mean, she has done such a poor job of being candid in, and responding to tough questions in the last six to nine months that I I, I really wonder how she's going to handle what are likely to be some very unfriendly and tough and probing questions from people like Senator Mark Warner, who really knows a lot about this subject. Now, um, we do have Sheryl Sandberg's written testimony in front of us. Um, at the beginning, she says, we were too slow to spot this, too slow to act. That's on us. This interference was completely unacceptable. It violated the values of our company and of the country that we love. She goes on to talk about what, what Facebook is doing about this. Um, and yet here we are, you know, weeks now away from the midterm elections. We already see signs that, that this is happening again. Um, you know, what do you think Sheryl Sandberg is really going to have to answer to here? Well, if I was a senator, I would ask her, rather than repeating the same thing she said before, which is what you just read, that's old news. They've said that time and time again. I think it's more or less meaningless. Why did it happen? How did they allow this to happen? Who was asleep at the wheel that allowed a system to emerge that was so intrinsically manipulable? Uh, I think that's a question that needs to be asked. I think, you know, you need to ask how global this problem might be. Um, what is the prospect that Facebook might be able to uh, ameliorate the interference in literally every country on the planet 
uh, which I frankly think is small. I don't think they can ameliorate it sufficiently. You know, the New York Times seems to be on a jihad. They had two articles in the last 24 hours, one of them about Libya, which is really hair-raising. And the way that in Libya, the warlords are targeting people for death and selling weapons and all this stuff on Facebook that certainly shouldn't be happening is completely a violation of their rules, and yet it's happening. And the article says, well, when New York Times pointed it out to Facebook, they took down this page and that page. But why don't they find this stuff themselves? Those are questions senators ought to be asking because the same sort of issues apply in U.S. electoral interference. The same thing uh, could be said for what's happened in Myanmar uh, with the help of Facebook, what's happened in the Philippines with the help of Facebook. I do want to talk a little bit about Google because Google will not be testifying. They decided not to uh, send uh, the CEO, Sundar Pichai, or, or, or Larry Page, or Sergey Brin, uh, but we also have uh, written what they would have said, uh, written testimony from um, Kent Walker, who's their top lawyer, uh, saying, Google remains deeply concerned about attempts to undermine democratic elections as we promised the committee last year. We have now fulfilled all four of our commitments to provide increased transparency in election advertising. So sort of taking the same tact here, you know, uh, we see this happening, we find it unacceptable. Here's what we're doing about that. And yet Google won't even be there to defend itself. How big a problem is that going yeah. to be for Google in the months ahead? We Especially given that the president uh, is very much focused on Google right now. We have fulfilled <laughs> all of our expect. That means they've already solved the problem. Is that what they're saying? That sounds completely implausible. I mean, we know that YouTube in particular is a very gameable system. I don't think it's as problematic as Facebook or to some degree Twitter. And I do think Google has done a lot of excellent things to control content, to restrict bad content but to suggest that they've done what they need to do is to me not true it's disingenuous it's it's the wrong thing to say this is an arms race like all bad things in digital and these companies are going to be finding new ways to manipulate their services coming from unexpected directions for the foreseeable future therefore what we need is a whole new set of processes from the companies and probably from external actors, whether they're government or other advisors, to help these companies figure out what to do. Because I do not believe or have the confidence that these companies have the tools to really address the scope of the problem they've encountered. Because the bottom line is they thought they were building you know, social and informational and advertising platforms, but they built also weapons, which are being weaponized at a very rapid pace in all kinds of ways. It's a big, big problem. All right, David, hang on, because uh, Wednesday's tech hearing isn't the only big showdown on Capitol Hill this week. In fact, the confirmation hearings for Brett Kavanaugh's nomination to the Supreme Court began Tuesday. Democratic senators tried to have the hearing adjourned within seconds of it beginning, regardless of the outcome. The court will have its share of tech-related cases to hear. Bloomberg Intelligence's tech litigation analyst Matt Larson is here with me now, and David Kirkpatrick still with me as well. Um, you know, talk to us about uh, as you're watching these Supreme Court nomination hearings. What comes to mind um, when you think about how Brett Kavanaugh might rule on some of the upcoming tech cases? Yeah, certainly. And you know, I'll preface it to say that some of the hearings that are going on with the uh, with the Facebook executives with Google submitting statements a lot of these hearings preview kind of the next generation of legislation and legal issues and so I think it's impor important to take that context uh, in mind when when thinking about how Kavanaugh or any Supreme Court nominee would fit into the existing court uh, issues of privacy of cybersecurity um, intellectual property tax antitrust there are a whole bunch of different things that fit together uh, when thinking about the tech implications for the Supreme Court but I would say at the forefront of everybody's mind at this point um, are the privacy concerns, how that translates over to the digital world. Uh, Kavanaugh um, was involved in some of the net neutrality rulings. And so I think that's from a tech perspective at the forefront of everyone's mind uh, when kind of getting into uh, some of his legal decisions and how he's thinking about cases. Free speech is very much at issue as well, especially when it comes to tech. What stays up, what comes down on these social media platforms, how has he ruled uh, on free speech, especially when it comes to digital platforms? Yeah, 
I, the the overarching way to think about the way that Kavanaugh has ruled in the past, I think, is pro free speech from a corporate perspective. So when you look at the net neutrality rulings and uh, and if you view those as some kind of restriction on how uh, the internet service providers are able to to restrict flow of certain data or information, Kavanaugh was highly critical of that. And in similar cases, he's kind of landed on we'll we'll say the pro business side of some of these free speech issues. Um, which goes with kind of, I guess, a general trend of wanting to to allow more free speech, but it's also, you know, a little bit of a concern when you think about how to best regulate uh, some of these companies moving forward. If there aren't sufficient protocol in place, there are also some national security concerns and uh, general security concerns that are implicated, um, and so it kind of strikes a balance between the free speech uh, and then Kavanaugh is also a, a staunch supporter of national security interests. So it, it, I guess it's a balance between those two issues. So, David, all that considered, is it a good thing or a bad thing um, for these tech companies that you have a judge who uh, is, 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 is pro-business, pro-free speech, um, but also as uh, the president, at the very least, is certainly ratcheting up the amount of attention he is paying to these tech companies that have made a lot of money, um, you know, under the prior administration? Well, certainly we are increasingly living in a technologized society, so the Supreme Court is going to be facing tech-related issues uh, more and more as time goes on. But I would say, on balance, what he believes would probably be good for the companies. I mean, America is all about free speech. It's part of our Constitution. He believes in the Constitution, clearly. Um, and these companies would dearly love to have some authority tell them from above what is and is not allowed when it comes to what what is said in the public sphere that's digital. Um, the thing about Kavanaugh that interests me is that he is such a legal scholar and he seems to be, for all of his extreme conservatism, deeply well respected for his scholarship. And I've seen it said that he's probably going to be the most scholarly Supreme Court justice if he gets on there that we've had in a long time. So it may be that his just sheer thoughtfulness will be beneficial because there's a lot of issues coming up that are not right or left issues that are just going to require some good, hard, solid thinking. Well, and uh, both liberals and conservatives, Matt, have criticized these platforms these platforms for being biased. Um, of late, you have President Trump saying that Google has a strong liberal bias. And, it, you know, when you search for Trump news, you know, you're seeing all um, um, anti-Trump articles. How might Kavanaugh's appointment and, and Kavanaugh weigh on an issue like that? Yeah, you know it's interesting in the in the context of all the of all the the Senate Judiciary Committee kind of weighing in and doing some grandstanding today. Uh, both sides will paint him as either you know too uh, <laughs> too extreme for for the Supreme Court. Uh, when you look through his record, he's certainly reached across the uh, the nomination aisle. You know, judges don't have an official affiliation, but he's he's been able to work together with. Uh, with judges who who show both conservative and liberal biases, uh, you know he's been on the same side as Merrick Garland in a number of criminal cases and other issues. Uh, he seems to take things from a textual perspective or textualist, so looking at kind of the letter of the law and trying to apply that strictly. Um, and so ideally that's somewhat agnostic as to a conservative or liberal view. I would tend to think that it, it sides probably more on the what you classify as the conservative side. Uh, but what we've seen from a lot of his jurisprudence is he, he tends to look at the rules. He likes if there's a bright line or as in the past suggested if there are bright line rules as to what you know content or behaviors cross the line, what's permissible, especially in a, like an employment law context. We've seen some of that uh, type of thinking. So you know I guess it's yet to be seen how it'll play out um, and you know some judges when they get uh, in the in the peer group of the Supreme Court maybe start to view things a little bit differently but you know I would say largely uh, probably conservative leaning but also you know kind of by the the letter of the the law or the agency regulations that are that are set forth tend to be how uh, Kavanaugh's ruled in the past all right Bloomberg's Matt Larson thanks so much as well as Techonomy founder David Kirkpatrick as always David great to have you here coming up Palantir is reportedly looking to go public. We'll talk about how Morgan Stanley may be leading the data mining, mining company to its IPO next. Plus, rumors continue to swirl around an SEC investigation into Elon Musk. We will take a look at just how ex extreme a penalty the Tesla CEO could face. This is Bloomberg.
14 years after entering the data mining scene, Peter Thiel's Palantir Technologies is nearing an IPO. After a decade of courtship, Morgan Stanley may be taking the lead. The bank is emerging as the data software company's advisor of choice, having earned about $60 million in fees, arranging private funding. That haul may double if Morgan Stanley handles the IPO in 2019 or early 2020. Here to tell us more, Bloomberg's Lizette Chapman. Lizette, what do we know? Hi. Um, well, uh, my colleague Sonali and I dug into this and found that in helping uh, delay Palantir go public and helping to arrange some of these private financings, Morgan Stanley not only deepened their relationships with Palantir, uh, but also came up with about $60 million in extra fees, which would be about the same amount that they would be able to generate by taking it public if the valuation stays as it was back in 2015, which right. is the and 20 there's a, billion. There's a question about the valuation, there's right? A, yeah, there's a lot of questions around the valuation. Um, since that peak uh, in 2015, it's been uh, revalued multiple times by various private and public investors, including Morgan Stanley, who most recently slashed their valuation after a series of reductions down to 4.4 billion from a high of 20 billion. Wow. So this is a massive and steady uh, decline in value, which um, would, of course, reduce the amount of fees um, should Morgan Stanley decide to take it. So public. which one is it? 20 or 4 billion? I mean, that's a huge difference. I mean, which way is the wind blowing? It is. And this is the challenge and some of the drama and the excitement around privately traded companies. And we've reported before when some of these markdowns first started happening back in 2016. So this is a two year long history that involves not only Palantir, but also it um, at the time involved now public companies, including Dropbox and Snap um, and and other ones where perfectly reasonable assessors of these values disagree on on what how much it's valued at because they are illiquid shares they trade in large blocks infrequently and the people assigning the values don't describe what they're using to base it on although it can range from different public comps to what their own internal projections are like for that whole market that they're attempting to address now what palantir does has been somewhat controversial given who they work for and, and the perceived value that they actually add. How do you think investors will see that? That's a good question. I think that there's an issue of Palantir as the company uh, and providing its software. It's a data mining software service uh, that's very consultant heavy, or it has been for a long time. And uh, what it does is it can pull all sorts of information in from financial transactions to last known location of a roadside bomb to status of immigrate, someone who is attempting to immigrate and pull it together in one spot, mine it for meaning, and then um, pull out certain patterns that people can dig into at a later date. Now, that's what it does. It just like Microsoft or IBM or Tableau, there's some other products out there that do that, do that and they make it very, very easy to use. And that gets to the second part of the question that you just addressed, which is, you know, how is this being viewed? And there are some concerns right now about the half of its business that services government agencies, including the Department of Defense, um, the Department of Homeland Security, um, the IRS, and, and other groups. Okay. Lizette Chapman, I know you'll be walking us through every step of the way on the road to potential IPO. Thanks so much for joining us. Still ahead, Elon Musk's fate partially lies in the hands of the SEC, but Tesla analysts say investors shouldn't be concerned. We'll talk about why next. This is Bloomberg. While investors betting on Tesla may be concerned about Elon Musk, legal analysts say not to worry. They say the SEC's reported probe into Musk's tweets about taking Tesla private is unlikely to lead to his ouster, though the agency has the power to ban Musk. Doing so may cause more pain for shareholders. Here to tell us more, Bloomberg's Ben Bain joining us from Washington, D.C. So, Ben, first of all, what does the agency have the power to do? What is the agency likely to do? 
Sure. So, uh, you know, f first off, what, what we know so far is uh, the SEC hasn't acknowledged that it is indeed investigating. Uh, Tesla has not done so. Uh, we've reported, and other media have as well, that there is a probe um, looking into uh, to Elon Musk's uh, tweets back uh, back early last month. So, uh, the SEC has has power uh, to to do uh, you know everything from fining uh, individuals or companies responsible for wrongdoing uh, all the way up to what executives really consider to be kind of the ultimate penalty, which is uh, some type of temporary, even permanent ban from serving as a director um, or as an executive at a company. Uh, what we understand, I mean, just talking to, to, to people uh, who, who kind of pay attention to these types of cases, is with what we know so far, it doesn't seem likely that, that based on the, you know the, the fact pattern around these tweets, that that's the kind of uh, direction that the SEC might go in. All that said, we don't know where this will go. This is, uh, you know, uh, a probe that the SEC itself has not even acknowledged. It's early on, and um, you know, we'll, we'll see where things go. But it doesn't seem likely that, based on what we know, the SEC would go there because ultimately, as you mentioned, shareholders would bear the ultimate brunt. And also, um, there's no suggestion at all that Mr. Musk somehow benefited financially um, from some insider information and in what he actually did by tweeting out, um, you know, that funding was secured. Uh, in early August. What about the bigger picture? I mean, you know, other analysts, former SEC lawyers have told us that the speed with which the SEC moved here when they, when the, or they issued that subpoena was quite fast and uh, meant that clearly they had another open inquiry or, or open investigation. Um, we believe that could be related to um, Model 3 production. So what about the bigger picture of what the SEC is interested in? Yeah, so we, we reported that the SEC's enforcement uh, attorneys uh, out in San Francisco were already looking into uh, some of the company's uh, statements about uh, production goals uh, and performance metrics uh, even before uh, Mr. Musk's tweet. Uh, what happens, though, is once kind of an enforcement investigation gets going, it's kind of like a black box, and, and, it, and we ultimately don't really know where things are going to go. It's, it's common that there's a lot of back and forth between uh, certainly, you know, the, the attorneys for the company, the attorneys for Mr. Musk, and the agency. Uh, they're going to be kind of uh, requesting some lots of documents, lots of information. Eventually, if the SEC does decide right. to go somewhere with this, uh, you know, then, then we'll get a better idea, but it could be months or years away. Bloomberg's Ben, Dame, ben Bain, I know you'll keep us posted. Thank you so much for weighing in. That does it for this edition of Bloomberg Tech. Tune in tomorrow. We'll have full coverage of those hearings from Capitol Hill. This is Bloomberg.